Hey, we're back with uh, Mr. Lauriers, uh, who we're both starting to realize we should have interviewed a very long time ago. Um, we last time we discussed um, medicine in general, uh, Western medicine in particular, Chinese medicine in particular, uh, classical Chinese medicine in even more particulars and the Tian lineage specifically, which is the lineage that um, Lori practices uh, to great effect. Um, we honed in on the question of confirmations where we got a uh, really a, a, a brilliant uh, one sentence definition, which seemed to be an impossible task before that happened. Um, and we discussed the confirmations as um, a sort of a way of understanding uh, physiology, the relationships between processes and organs in the body, and how yin and yang interact in the body. And then we ended with um, an interesting look at some uh, cases that Laurie had seen a long time ago before he gained this enormous experience and how he would look at them now. Um, today's session, we're going to dedicate to formulas. Um, I don't know much about Chinese medicine, but the first time that I heard Lori speak, he was talking about uh, Chai Hu Greater Gan Jan Tang. And um, it was fascinating to me, even with my limited knowledge. Uh, Yasin will be asking him the first question. Yasin, take it away. Thank you, Alid. Um, yeah, um, so we're picking up having just discussed the clinical effectiveness of the Tian lineage. Um, we picked a particular example looking at um, patients coming in with the uh, uh, menopause. Oh, we, we went first from um, an example about thyroid deficiency and how that can present differently. And then we we went into uh, the uh, an example surrounding menopause. Uh, so the next question is sort of, Going back to this idea of clinical effectiveness, um, but taking it from the perspective of formulas. Um, so could you address um, whether classical formulas themselves are a factor uh, in, in this clinical effectiveness? Um, what makes them more effective than later formulas uh, or the individually designed formulas or anything else really um yeah yeah i mean i think first it's important to kind of define what we're talking about when we say classical formulas because the classical formulas are what, what are known as jing feng you know canonical formulas or the, the canonical method or classical method the strict definition is basically those formulas which appear in in the, the classical text and classical texts are defined as those kind of roughly of the Han dynasty and before that, those that are called the Jing or the canons of Chinese medicine, you know, like Neijing, um, Nanjing and so on. And then also we get into what would be like the clinical classics like the Shanghan Lun and so on. So the, the, the kind of strict definition of, of a classical formula or canonical formula is a formula which appears in one of those texts and really what most people mean when they're talking about classical forms are the forms of the Shanghai Lun because really there's in, in the Neijing, the Huangdi Neijing, um, there are a few formulas, but they're not really, you know, they're very small, quite, you know, kind of quite vague. People don't really use them much. Um, so really what people are referring to are the formulas of the Shanghai Lun. Now we could also bring in the Tang Yijing, which is a very, um, Controversial topic. There's a lot of discussion around it. So the Tang Yejing was seen as the almost like the formula classic, and it's one of those texts that was lost um, through time. So with you know with the herbal tradition, you have the Shenong Ben Saoqing, which is like the single herb classic. It's the first text which outlines the flavor and the actions of the single herbs. The Tang Yejing is considered the first text which outlines formula science and formulas. Now that text was lost, and then Tao Hong Jing claimed to have like found it and basically put the parts of it he found in um, in some of his works, um, Fu Xing Zhui, 
Um, but now there's a lot of a lot of debate about whether what he recorded was original Tanya Jing or what he made up or something else. So that that is an area of contention. And you know, I'm happy to accept there's debate about that. We take that the excerpts of the Tanya Jing, which we have from Tao Hong Jing's works, to be the Tanya Jing and to be the formula blueprints for the Shanghan Lun. Other people can debate that. That's fair enough. You know, <laughs> we take them as as that. But whether you do or not, they're still useful formulas. But basically. Classical formulas um, are not any pre-modern formula. They're strictly speaking the formulas of, of the classics of the canons, and especially people are generally referring to the, the formulas of the Shanghai Lun. So I think it's important to kind of point out what we're talking about when we when we um when we're talking about classical formulas. Now, in answer to your question, I, I do firmly believe, yes, that they Classical form, the classical forms themselves are a have have a big part in the effectiveness of classical medicine. Um, and there's there's a we we can kind of group the reason for this into two broad categories. One is taking the formulas themselves as individual formulas. Then we can look at the overall system of of the formulas as the whole. Now, looking at the formulas as standalone formulas. Um, Saying that they are a big part of the effectiveness doesn't mean that any formula that came later isn't effective or that you know forms that came later were rubbish. There are some there are a lot of very good formulas that came later um, and very effective. And again, it comes down to this idea of focus and understanding a formula in its context. So later schools developed formulas and formula structures out of their own specific needs, just partly out of what was available to them based around their style of practice. So if you fully understand the formula system you practice that's great and you can probably as, be you know as effective that's that won't hamper you nowadays again it's very eclectic which isn't necessarily you know it it it's it potentially makes it harder i think it's the best way to put it because when you're practicing an eclectic system you just have loads and loads of different formula structures with loads and loads of different herbs and unless you really understand the context for each form each formula and you've developed a really really clear system for how to apply the all of these formulas drawn from many different sources it becomes very very difficult to actually understand how they will fit into a complete system um as standalone formulas a general trend that you see through time is that the classical forms are generally much much smaller much more concise and much more focused as you move through time you do see formulas you know getting a bit bigger getting more herbs on the whole um, and especially now modern day practice forms are generally qu quite massive and i was taught in my original training you know that small formulas don't work you shouldn't you know i remember having one lecturer who would say you know you should never really prescribe anything less than 15 herbs which to me now feels massive I, if my formula gets more than 10 herbs, it starts to look very, very big to me. That's not to say I'd never prescribe that and that it's bad. It just looks very big to me. And I'll, I'll explain reasons for that later. But nowadays, it's very common to have like 15, 20, 25 herb formulas, which isn't the case classically. The biggest classical formula be a judge mine is 23 herbs. After that, you have one that's 21 herbs. And then you have a few that are kind of 12 to 14. But the majority of classical formulas are kind of three to eight herbs um so they're very very clear and really if we come to the kind of complete system of classical forms as a whole they are not designed to treat symptoms or treat diseases as such they are designed as a complete model to address the failure of function so we talked about that system of five and six five elements six confirmations um you know there's a lot more to go into there about in which scenario you use one or the other and how they overlap. But basically, if we understand that as a model for physiology, you then understand the whole formula system in the classics is designed around dress it, addressing every possible major disruption of that physiology. So you, you no longer have, um, you know, like a formula for symptoms of like bloating or loose stool. You have a formula to address um you know, the cooling off of the earth element, of the spleen, the center, and then you have, you know, you have a form based to address that one mechanism, and you have one formula for that. And then you have another form to address the other variation of that mechanism. And this is a very, very kind of tight, concise system. So in, in the Tang Ye Jing, 
there were believed to be originally, you know, around 360 formulas. And this comes back to the idea that the, um, well, this is actually something we didn't talk about. The, um, the idea of five and six, you know, the five elements and six confirmations, um, the, that, that, that kind of comes out a lot of what is known as a Wu and Liu Qi system, which was like basically an early calendar, an early way of understanding time. And again, this comes back to the idea of classical Chinese science um, being the same principles running throughout the recording of time, looking at agriculture, looking at human physiology and so on. So they looked at the movement of the, the earth around the sun and therefore the change in the environments and so on, all operating according to these same rules. And it's basically just a system of quite advanced mathematics, um, you know, working out where the, where the earth is likely to be at a certain time and that would determine the differences of weather and climate within a certain season. This happens on repeating cycles of about 360 years. Um, the idea of 360, you know, is the idea of 360 degrees in a circle. Now, obviously, the, the, the Earth isn't completely spherical, so it wobbles a bit, so it becomes 365 and so on. Um, but that's, you know, that's worked out through multiples of five and six, five element six confirmations. Um, so bringing that back to formula science, if we're using that same five and six model and seeing the, the um, human as a you know, microcosm of the outside environment, the Tanya Jing originally had 360 formulas to address every possible variation in that cycle. Now, obviously, a lot of them have been lost and we don't have all of them that are left. But the Shenkan Lun is very much based on a Tanya Jing model. As I said before, you know, there's a lot of controversy about whether what we have is a Tanya Jing is or not. We... We maintain that it is, but you know, if people want to have that debate, they can. But basically, it comes back to the idea that these are formulas to treat any disruption in this model of physiology. So when we put that into the body, you know, we look at the six confirmations. There are, I'll bring this back to the model that we talked about earlier, you know, the idea of Tai Yang's being the growing of Yang, basically Xiao Yang being that little bit of Yang when the sun pops over the horizon, when you start to wake up in the morning, you know, Yang moves into your periphery, and then it grows to Tai Yang um, at the height of Yang at the middle of the day. Now, there was, there are a group of formulas called the, the Yang Dan Tangs and the Yin Dan Tangs in the Tang Ye Jing, which were later adopted into the Shang Lun. And what they mean is the, the dawn warming decoction and the dawn cooling decoction. Now, the yang dang tangs um, are the dawn warming decoction. It basically means when you're not generating enough yang to move peripherally to manifest full tai yang. So, again, it's a symbolic idea um, to mean those, those formulas basically help warm blood and circulate it to the periphery to manifest full yang at the periphery or to manifest tai yang. And then the dawn cooling decoctions are the opposite. It's when you get too much outward movement of yang too quickly, too much flaring of heat at the surface. So you cool the dawn. So it's that symbolic idea that you're kind of either not getting to midday, not getting the fullest manifestation of yang, or you're getting to that too quickly and you're getting a flaring of fire. And that will produce certain symptoms. Um, so the these forms are designed to kind of address those those aspects of failure of physiology rather than to treat you know certain diseases i'll pause maybe. here uh, uh, laurie for a clarification if you don't mind mm. seems like a good place you're making a distinction between the physiological function of the body uh, and then i suppose the pathological dysfunction of the body um that's on the one hand and then on the other hand um specific symptoms mm. And so, you know, um, you know, if you say uh, you you talked about warming the warming the the middle, hmm. um, <clears throat> so the middle should be warm. Are you saying that if it's then if that if that middle is not warm, it's cold, you can have a whole range of symptoms. You do not require either a different formula or even a different herb for each one of those symptoms. You only need a formula to restore that basic function, and then those symptoms will resolve as a as a natural byproduct of that physiological function returning. Yeah, exactly. And then that's how classical form is designed around those kind of units. So again, in the Tang Jing, there's this model called the mutual containment of the five elements. Um, now the five elements kind of represent 
the organs in the internal body. Um, so, you know, earth would be the center, middle jowl. Um, the way we use herbs is through the five flavors. So the way the five elements represent itself in herbs is through the five flavors. So, for example, in the body, the wood element is the liver, is the rising of blood and so on. In herbs, that's the pungent flavor. So any pungent flavor would tonify the wood element. So the way we apply herbs is if we want to tonify wood, we use the flavor which represents the function of wood, which is a pungent flavor. So by using a pungent flavor, we're putting more wood into the body. So take that example of um, a cold center. If, if the center, the earth, is cold and damp, that means two things. It means the fire element is not warming it, and the wood element is not controlling it. So the wood element controls the earth element. It ensures that the fluids on the center are moved and lifted from the center, because the earth does nothing by itself. It just kind of sits there. It needs the fire to warm it. It needs the wood to move it, to control it. So when you have that cold at the center, that means that's a failure of fire warming and a failure of wood controlling. So then you're going to use a pungent flavor, or at least in the classical model, you use a pungent flavor to tonify wood, to generate fire, which will then warm earth, and also to tonify wood to control earth, to lift fluids and to move the earth, basically. So it doesn't become encumbered with dampness. Now, in the Tanya Jing, the, what's known as the wood herb of the earth, the, sorry, the earth herb of the wood class is ginger. Because it's a pungent flavor that tonifies the wood element, but to benefit earth. So you would use ginger as your primary herb for that. And specifically, you know, for cold and center, you'd use dry ginger to revive the yang of the center. So whenever you are warming the yang of the center, you are using dry ginger. And that's it. And all your formulas to warm the center are based around dry ginger. If you're not using that, you're not warming the center classically. Mm -hmm. um, if you are using it, you are warming the center. And if that doesn't work to warm the center, then it's not warming the center that needs to be done. You know, so you don't. Like, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So that's actually that's actually it's interesting because it you're 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 dealing with that basic fundamental physiology. This is not this does not sound like a like a general or a vague sort of use of herbs, right? Like it's a very precise understanding of how each herb corresponds to a particular aspect of physiology yeah yeah That's yeah awesome. and classical forms are based around these herbs which revive fundamental physiology um why they were chosen specifically and not others you know it's the, the process is never kind of outlined but it it does kind of play out that these tend to be the perfect balance of kind of chi or hot and cold and flavor to actually revive that function to match that function as much as possible in the body because that's what you're doing by giving herb is giving the body some of that function so it can revive that function enough to be able to carry it on itself now yeah so now then if you were to warm the center you are using that dry ginger or ganjang as the primary herb then you will use other herbs for example if if the center is cooled off and got very damp you're going to need to use a bitter flavor to help reduce the earth element to reduce the dampness that's encumbered the the earth element, and also to reduce its char of metal to basically help that dampness move out through the intestines and that would be a warm bitter herb with the predominance of its bitter flavor what we call it you know thicker flavor so that would be the herb baiju so a ganjang plus baiju combination means you are warming the center and removing cold dampness now if you had the other situation where you actually had cooling off of the center so fluids are stuck on top there's a little bit of heat trapped in that you would need a cold bitter herb but still a thick bitter flavor which would then be the herb huanglian so ganjang plus huanglian is damage to the yang or the function of the center, cooling off the center with hot damp that's stuck on top. And ganjang and baiju is damaging the center with cold damp that's stuck on top. And you get these repeating units mm -hmm. again and again. So you, whenever you are doing, whenever you're warm the center, it's always ganjang. And then what you're combining with it tells you the other thing that you're doing, basically. So classical forms are based around this constantly repeating structure. So if you're treating high yin, or the earth element, reviving the earth, you're using ganjang. If you are not using that, you are not treating it. If you see what I mean, you're sending that message to the body. It's a very, very clear, simple message. And because every formula that warms a center classically is based around ganjang, you know exactly what that form is doing, and it's a very clear message to the body. And this brings us to kind of what I was saying earlier about the eclectic nature of more modern systems where they draw formulas from loads of different systems. Each formula in and of itself may not be, may be very good, but in one formula, you use 
a particular herb to warm the center. In another form, you use a different herb to warm the center, which behaves a bit differently. And then in the third formula, another one. And each of those doctors that designed that original formula would have had a complete system based around the use of those individual methods. And they'll know how that method combines with others to create other structures and so on. But when you lump them all together, you lose that context. Mm. And you start using vastly different herbs to try and achieve a similar thing. But because they're different, they'll have a different emphasis and do it in a different way. Just because of the approach of that different system. Or you will have, you'll be using kind of the same herb with an intention to do something different or in different combination, which just won't work because you're not combining, you're not giving the body the right signals consistently. Because herbs will do different things depending on how you combine them. And you need a clear, consistent method of combination to communicate with the body what you want it to do. So it's, it's almost like um, whenever you're prescribing a formula or herbs, you're communicating with the body, asking it to do something. And just because you ask the body to do something doesn't mean it's going to do it. You've got to communicate clearly to the body and you've got to communicate something to the body that the body can actually do. And it's almost like saying, you know, if I just take words from all different languages, I can have a better conversation. It's like, well, no, you actually have to understand the context of how that word is used within that language. So if we were talking and I start throwing in Dutch words and French words without an understanding of their context, you have no clue what I was saying. And I wouldn't really have a clue what I was communicating to you, actually, because I wouldn't know how those words are used. And that's very much the kind of conversation you're having with the body when you're just giving like really eclectic forms, unless you've really clearly built a system around that. Now, classical forms are very, very clearly well-structured. They're a very clear kind of language that you're communicating with the body. Well, I mean, it's also, um, it's a, it's a, it's a very fascinating, um, it's a very fascinating issue because I suppose that's one of the best um, explanations of I've heard of why a lineage in general is important because that that must take a lot of time to fine tune your understanding of herb each herb, mm -hmm. let alone each herbal combination, let alone each formula. Like that's a long process, mm -hmm. right? I mean, can one person sit down and do that? Like, you know, one weekend. I mean, yeah, it is a long process, but. I think the good thing about classical forms is you don't actually use a lot of herbs. So in throughout time, there's been different like material medica, different herb books written and different formula books written over time. Classically, the, like the Shannon Benzhaging, the first material medica for single herbs is actually quite small. Then as you get into later years, you know, you get like thousands and tens of thousands of herbs used, <laughs> tens of thousands of formulas in formula books. But classically, it's actually quite small because you have these repeating structures, you know, if you have a formula which revives the yang of the center, the warmth of the center, and removes cold dampness. You don't need any other formula to do that. Mm -hmm. You've got that core fundamental structure there. And then because all of these structures are so closely related, such a modular system in the Shanghai Lin is actually much, much quicker to learn those, those formulas because you really do understand that through understanding these fundamental structures, you can make little tweaks to actually alter how they, they function. Rather than needing to learn completely new formulas, you you can make these little tweaks. It's almost like learning your formulas are like learning really key signposts on a map. And then by making little tweaks, you link these little these kind of signposts up to create a, a bigger kind of kind of map to really understand the whole geography of the area that you're you're working on. Um, so if you're in a town, you know, you're learning, if you're learning six confirmations and the primary formula to write, revive the function of each six confirmation. Then you can, and they're like the main roads within the town. You can then start to learn little size streets in between them, rather than just being told a load of street names and you know, rather than just being given a map with all the little side streets and so on. You can learn the key fundamental mm. structures first, the key fundamental streets to orientate yourself around them, and then you can fill in all the details from that. And that becomes a lot easier. Like it is a long term process, but it's you can see a structure to it very very clearly. Like if we look at the formula Guaja Tang, which is to treat a tying issue. Um, the formula Guajatang has multiple variations. It's one of the things people always talk about when they talk about the Shanghai and learn how there's like 70 or so variations. I can't remember how many exactly, but there's there's a lot of variations of Guajatang. And a lot of them are just changing the dose of one herb to alter the emphasis a little bit. So you you have Guajatang. If you double the amount of Bai Shao in it, it becomes the formula Guajajia Shao Tang, which then treats abdominal cramping. If you then add another herb, Yitang, to it, it becomes the formula Shao Jensong Tang which is then actually nourishing the center and building blood a lot more, and it's much more cooling for the center. Whereas on the flip side, if you take the Bai Shao out of that formula, it becomes Guajia Chu Shao Tang, which is to treat an irregular heart. So 
you're actually reviving the yang to the point where the heart can maintain a regular heartbeat. So just with these little tweaks, you can really, you, as long as you understand the fundamental function of Tai Yang and what Guage Tang is doing, you can understand these little tweaks because these herbs are all units reviving physiology. So if you make these little tweaks, you can make quite a fundamental shift in how the formula is, is working. And that can actually help inform your understanding of physiology as well. Because the Shen Lin doesn't talk about physiology much, but it gives you a very clear method for prescribing formulas. When you look at the formulas, when you understand them as units of physiology, basically supporting units of physiology, you can see by the changes in formulas and through an understanding of the, the herbs and how adding, removing, increasing, decreasing dosage of those herbs changes the, the structure of the formula, you can understand how that's changing physiology. So you can really see them as guides as kind of map for physiology. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to ask a quick follow-up question that, that I, th I think leads into the next question um, rather well um, anyway. Um, but we've, so to picking up on some key words and sort of thinking back to some of the, the, um, the, other, con the other conversation we had in the last session, you've, you've talked about reviving physiology, um, right? You're talking about tweaking, um, and so th this is giving us an idea of of, of this um, approach within this lineage. Um, um, and now thinking again, because we're we're talking to you as as primarily as patients, and I have um, um, experience being treated as well from uh, a TCM um, approach. There's a lot of talk about nourishing, you know, deficiencies and mm -hmm. um, feeding and sending in, you know, uh, substance and so on and so forth. Um, now, that sounds to me with my lay ears to be a fundamental difference um, in what these formulas are doing clinically. Um, could you maybe... That's not a a, a, ter a terribly clear question because I I don't know how to formulate it. Um, but could you tell us something about um, these two approaches, perhaps? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know what you mean. Basically, it's um so Sony's so medicine classical times is very functionally focused. It's very focused on supporting function over time, and especially right up to Monday, it's become much more focused on nourishing matter in the body so early past forms you notice they're, they're very focused around reviving the yang reviving the function that doesn't mean they're just all about bombing the body with warm herbs but they're, they're much more around actually reviving a function um nowadays it's much more like having nourishing food it's putting more nourishment in um that's not to say you don't nourish in classic forms there's some in incredibly nourishing classic forms like jugan tang is one of the most nourishing forms you will see in you know the whole of the chinese medical like formula library you know it's like a thick soup when you boil it it's, it's like a syrup basically you know it's masses of sheng di mai men dong er, jiao ren shen and so on so you have very very nourishing formulas in in the han dynasty but it was very much more around around reviving function and this this is because chinese medicine is essentially a functional medicine its aim is reviving function and that was as much, much more emphasized in, in the Han dynasty. Um, less so nowadays, I think just th there's numerous reasons for that happening, really. I mean, certainly mindsets over time have changed to much, a much more kind of materialistic mindset rather than a functional mindset. Um, herbs that revive function are generally more kind of pungent, warm herbs. There is the, you, you have to be a bit more careful using them. You have to use them properly. They are more likely to produce adverse effects if not used properly but the flip side is if used properly they generally produce quicker stronger effects so you see over time um certain herbs going out of fashion and being replaced by more moderate herbs you definitely see that trend over time like guaja which is much much more warming guaja and marpong kind of phasing out of forms over time being replaced by much more moderate herbs to release the surface so that's another aspect. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's a very weird thing that that nowadays forms have become, you know, it's really reached its peak now where forms have become just very, very nourishing. I think that's partly because, partly because of the materialistic mindset, but partly, and partly because like, if you notice diagnosis nowadays are much more focused around efficiency. It's very rare people, people don't really like, 
they're not good at understanding excess patterns basically or diagnosis. and a lot of stuff is always deficiency spleen deficiency yin deficiency and so on um i find it interesting that in the han dynasty there would have been less abundance of nutrition around and yet they look more functionally whereas now i think especially in the western world where we have an obesity ep epidemic you can talk about the quality of nutrition but you can't say people are suffering a lack of nutrition um <laughs> that's definitely not the case um so yeah, it's it's just a thing that's kind of changed over time. And yeah, much modern formulas, they're much more focused on nourishment. But one thing that classical formulas really have in them, which modern formulas often lack, is the understanding that if you're putting nourishment into the body, you need to metabolize that nourishment. You still need to digest it and make it usable. Mm. And to do that, you're using the body's own yang. So what you see, even in classical forms that are very nourishing, they're always reviving the yang and helping the metabolism of the nourishing forms within them. And modern formulas are not always doing that. Um, what you and this is why you know I said earlier, like when or when we gave that case previously about you know somebody who, you know they they gave a yin tonic form but added loads of damp drainers in. That's they can actually digest the formula, which already tells me that their problem is not yin deficiency. You know, if somebody and th these are two very common diagnoses: yin deficiency and dampness, and not necessarily together. But you will often see this, like people saying, oh, this person is yin deficient, but they're too damp to take the formula. Well, that would tell me they're not lacking fluids. They have abundant fluids in their body. They're not metabolizing. So they need the function of their fluid metabolism revived so they can actually use those fluids. So they, they're not lacking in. They're just not digesting things properly, metabolizing and moving fluids to the proper area. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a very, very important thing. And that's something that's... The understanding of, of metabolizing forms, actually just metabolizing fluids in the body is not well understood nowadays, I think. And it's definitely something which is very prominent in classical formula science. And you actually see certain more modern formulas are actually classical formulas where the warmth and the metabolism is being taken out, and often to the detriment of, of the form, the effectiveness of the formula. Because um, people just became more and more scared of pungent warm herbs. That's something which you definitely see over time. Uh... So I guess an example of that would be taking um, uh, century one and taking out the foods. And the, is that kind of the kind of thing you were talking about? Yeah, exactly. So century one becoming Liu Di Huang Wan, taking out um, greater foods or um, who is it? Chen Li, I think, who made that formula. Um, Liu Di Huang Wan. He said he took out foods of Rogue but really foods are greater. And, you know, he was, that's, that's, it's a really interesting form because when he created it, he was a pediatrician and he created it for, for kids. And he said, children have abundant yang and weak yin. So he took Shen Chiwan and took out the, the, the cinnamon, the rogue or greater and the foods are. Hmm. Now, Liu Di Huang is seen as the main form for yin deficiency in women. It's one of the main forms given for, you know, for yin deficiency during, um, during menopause you know we talked about that last time but and it seems genius form where there's three tonics and three drainers you know there's the shengdi or what's now used is shudi originally it was well originally it was gandhi which is we now equate with shengdi anyway that's something else um so there's the shengdi shanyao shenju and then there's the fuling mirampi this year um originally there was those herbs but there's also the greater foods mm. because Shen Chiwen was a taxation formula regime. Taxation is a long-term lifestyle disease. So it's basically long-term depletion of your yang and your yin through lifestyle factors. And it's basically what we call yang and blood deficiency as opposed to just yang deficiency. It's not just a function of the body that's failing, which would be common in Shang Han formulas. The matter is also being depleted. And the way that happens is you start to deplete yourself through lifestyle factors, basically you know, excessive lifestyle, excessive work, excessive sex, excessive drinking, lack of rest, all of that. You weaken your yang because in every disease, yang is weakened because function will always fail before matter. So you cannot have a failure of yin without a failure of yang, but you can have a failure of yang without a failure of yin. So you can't have a loss of matter without a loss of function. So you deplete yourself through lifestyle factors. Your yang starts to become weak and bloat, which means you can't hold yin in the body. So you start to lose fluids. So therefore your blood dries out. Now in Shen Chuan, what you're doing, you need, you need to revive the yang because the person has basically worn themselves out. But you also need the fluids to build the blood to hold on to that yang. So you need the Guaja Futsa to put the yang back in the lower, but you also need to build blood to hold on to yang, and that's why the Shengdi is in there. 
to hold that. Now, if you take out the Gwe Jafutsa, um, you're just putting a load of nourishment in, but you, you then again, you have to use the body's own yang to actually metabolize that nourishment and get it into the blood and hold it in the blood. So you're actually, you know, stressing the body further. Those herbs aren't in there to, well, they are in there to revive yang, but they're in, in a patient who needs that formula, th those herbs aren't going to overly heat them. You, you need to put that yang in so yang can be rooted back in the lower. Mm -hmm. So taking them out just actually makes it harder for the body to actually process the formula and to actually root its yang back in the blood. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it, that's a very good example of, of that. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's interesting that that's a that's a that that was a pediatric formula because I assume what you're saying is somebody who's that young, their 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 functionality is probably high. I mean, like they're capable of doing these things. Is that what you're saying? That's what Chenny would think. We we do think that actually kids are meant to have abundant yang. So if they're already starting to suffer pathology, that shows already a failure of function. Mm. Like if 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 somebody was already starting to show those urinary symptoms. And so on, then we would actually, we wouldn't use Lewy Deep Hongman, basically. Like we would still feel Yang needs reviving because kids are meant to have abundant Yang. So already if, if they're starting to show that failure of function, that they don't have enough Yang. They'll have more Yang than an adult, but they should do. But the fact they're showing their symptoms already shows a depletion of Yang. So we, we hold the view that kids are meant to have abundant Yang. So if kids are pathological and they're not showing explicit heat signs, they are already cold. Like they're already cooling off. So we, we would kind of, maintain that idea but the creator louis de Hoan, didn't think that he said kids have abundant yang with yin and i would say kids are probably more able to tolerate um louis de Hoan, or like a similar thing like a lack of yang quantification mm. than adults would be I'd, I'd probably agree they're more able to tolerate it but just from the you know from the perspective of my lineage so on we we still wouldn't see that as a place to take out the yang conics we would still want them in there for the very reason that that pathology is occurring there's still that failure of function. So I think in a second, Yasin is going to ask you for a sort of in-depth um, comparison of, you know, um, like it, it, the Shen Chi one example is interesting because it is a, it's a, it's a classical formula. Somebody mm. made a modification. That modification is a bit problematic, right? In certain contexts. Mm. Um, <clears throat> in a second, I think Yasin and I are going to want to know you know, for for the same function or for the same um, sort of problem, uh, you know, what is a formula that you think kind of misses the mark a little bit or isn't isn't precise enough or something? But I want to take a step back because I think to understand that we need to do a little bit more talking about this classification of the herbs that you were saying. So you were saying ganjang was the uh, uh, earth herb of the wood class. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That implies that there's a um, there's a wood herb of the wood class. There's a metal herb of the wood class. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So the, the Tanya Jing has this model, the mutual containment of the five elements, which is a model of 25 herbs. Um, all categorized according to their favor. Fly, flavor, five of each element. And flavor, the, like I said before, the use of flavor the, the use of herbs is based on flavor and its chi. Um, its chi means whether it's, you know, it's hot or cold, warm um, or cool. And basically, coming back to that idea of five and six, you know, five elements, six confirmation, the five elements in plants is the five flavors. The six that is the, the hot and the cold, you know, not six, but it's that's the yin and yang of herbs, hot and cold. So there again, you have that that repeating theme running throughout. Now you have slight variation in that whether the flavor is thick or thin, or whether the um, chi is thick or thin. So, and this is all outlined in in the Neijing. It's, it, it's chapter three, I think. Flavor goes to yin and can be thick or thin. Chi goes to yang can be thick or thin. So, if if each herb has a flavor and a chi, and the emphasis. Each, each herb will have a different kind of combination, though. So some of the flavor will be more emphasized, some of the chew will be more emphasized. And of that, in some, the flavor will be the overruling influence when it's action. In others, it will be mostly the flavor, but a bit of chi. In others, it, the chew will be the overruling herb, the overruling factor. Um, and that's what thick and thin means. So a, a herb that has a thick flavor, it means that 
its action is primarily governed by its flavor and its flavor is just overruling its chi isn't that important it has a bit of an influence but it's not that important a good example of that would be something like kong lian it's a thick bitter flavor it works because it's very very bitter um other herbs are more based on their chi and its chi can be thick and thin so you could say something like shurgao is a very cold herb its main influence you could say is because it's cold i mean again this is <laughs> there's no definitive text on this so it is a bit open it's it's one of those things that some herbs are very very clear other there's some debate so you could say sugar is maybe a, a thin chi it's, it's definitely cold but it, it's pungent flavor has a bit of an influence or something like futsa it's you could say it's thick chi it's very very hot and that's why it works you know so yeah comes down to that that's how herbs fit into this model of yin and yang in five element six confirmations now in the tang yejing it has this very good model of 25 herbs five for each element now, all the herbs within the wood element will be pungent because pungent is the flavor that tonifies wood, according to um, chapter 22 of the Su Wen. And that's a functional model again, because I know there's another model also mentioned later in Su Wen, which is much more popular now. And that's how that's the flavor that correlates with the element, but not necessarily the flavor which tonifies it. So in that model, you know, sour correlates with wood, bitter with fire, sweet with earth, pungent with metal salty with water that's a correlation so for example if you look at wood correlates with the springtime in nature correlates with the green color because things are turning green in spring if you take a little sapling in spring and taste it it will taste sour fruits that are unripe in the springtime taste sour so sour correlates with wood but that doesn't mean that therapeutically that's the flavor that tonifies wood those therapeutic flavors are outlined in chapter 22 of the Neijing, and that's the flavor model you have to follow to understand classical formulas and that basically means the flavor mimics the function of the element within the body so pungent tonifies wood because wood is an upwards outwards movement within the body pungent is an upwards outwards movement within the body so so by putting pungent in you are putting the function of wood in the body the same as bitter tonifies water according to chapter 22 of the CUN because bitter um, water wants to consolidate it wants to keep all your fluids in deep storage in the body you know water is a state of death and consolidation Bitter flavors consolidate. They pull matter into deep storage. So bitter tonification water means consolidating water in the lower. So the so, flavor. I, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, uh, there's a lot of information and I saw, so I want to make sure that I'm not making assumptions as we move along. So I'm, let me take the example of the Tai Yang because it, that seems to be our, hmm. our confirmation at the moment. When you say you're going to take the you take the the that that pungentness that's that's um uh that's associated with wood you're putting it in the body, mm. you know if you're taking so say cinnamon is 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 associated with wood um you're you're by putting it in the body and you're talking about this upwards and outwards movements of wood, you're saying that cinnamon then in some way uh, produces or helps the body or restores to the body that ability to move up and out, which is the circulation. Mm. Or part of it is that out, outward movement of the circulation to the periphery. Yeah. And so we understand now that cinnamon is related to circulation and to circulation functioning in a particular way, pushing up and out towards the surface. Yeah, yeah. That's quite beautiful. Okay. Thank yeah, you. yeah. No, no, that's a really good example. Because then, yeah, if we come back to the idea of Tai Yang, the, so... Taiyang, the full name of the Taiyang Confirmation is Taiyang Cold Water of the North. Um, as you know, as we talked about before, it's small intestine bladder in terms of the organs and channels that correlate with it in the body. Guaija is the primary herb to revive the function of Taiyang. The function of Taiyang is that circulation of warm blood below the surface. And for that to happen, the small intestine needs to warm the bladder, which then steams fluids through the bone marrow, and it takes on the salty flavor, moves into the bloodstream, and therefore moves up and out to the periphery. Pai yang is about that growing and outwards movement of yang to manifest full yang at the surface or full, you know, warm blood at the surface. Now, if that's failing, the way you would support that is using guaija, which is a pungent herb that tonifies the wood element. Wood will then fan fire on top. It will tonify the heart on top, which will pump more warm blood down to the small intestine, its paired organ. And it's a small intestine there, which the tai yang small intestine, which provides the yang to warm the water of the bladder to promote that generation of blood and outward proliferation of blood so when we look at six confirmation physiology each confirmation is paired with a yin and yang pair 
and that's called it's you know it's Biao Ben Zongqi theory again all from 6774 of the Neijing. Biao Ben Zongqi theory means that this this kind of ties in the elemental pairs with the six confirmation pairs. So you have Tai Yang, which is bladder, small intestine, but Tai Yang as a confirmation is paired with Xiao Yin. That's its Yin pair because Xiao Yin is heart kidney. So Tai Yang is small intestine, which is paired with the heart, and bladder, which is paired with the kidney. Now confirmations at, at the root of each confirmation is kind of a root chi of root quality so at the root of tai yang is the cold chi mm -hmm. at the root of xiao yin is fire because xiao yin is imperial fire of this house so at the root the root quality of xiao yang uh, xiao yin is imperial fire the root quality of um tai yang is cold water of the north so these two balance each other out you know it's this constant the body is basically made of these constant clashing elements and as long as they're kept pretty equal they stay in balance so you have the warm fire of the south, which balances out the cold water of the north, and vice versa. So Tai Yang balances Xiao Yin. Now Tai Yang's function will fail when the presence of the warming of Xiao Yang within it fails. Mm. So that's when you don't get enough warm blood circulating to the surface, when you don't get enough warmth coming from Xiao Yin to warm Tai Yang. And that's how that happens. The Xiao Yin heart doesn't supply the warmth to the small intestine. So the small intestine cools down, and therefore it can't supply the warmth to the bladder. So therefore the cold water within the water aspect tank becomes redundant and you get cold at the surface or an inability to withstand cold on the surface. So Guajia there is restoring the Xiaoyan Zongqi, the, the warmth within the Taiyan confirmation via the heart's link with the small intestine. So yeah, Guajia is a very, very good example of, of how that happens. Right, so we have, a, we, have an, we have an herb that's classified um, according to this kind of uh, five movements as... Mm to the wood and that having this certain quality we're imbi we're 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 taking that in that is producing that upwards and outwards in the body via the interaction of these organs with each other and the substance and how they regulate the substances in the body yeah i have one clarifying point we have not mentioned the liver in that process we said the heart we said the small intestine mm. we said the bladder and then that steaming thing so the warmth and so everything starts moving upwards towards the surface. Mm. We can intuitively understand how heat produces that, right? Um, wouldn't wood generally be associated with the liver? Yes. Yeah. So in that sense, Quaja is actually tonifying the wood element, the liver, to generate fire. The process of the steaming up and out of blood and so on is then actually Tai Yang. But interestingly, the, if you look at the um six confirmations the the confirmation which correlates with liver is drain mm. which is liver pericardium now the naging says tai yang is rich in blood with little chi and it's the most yang of the yang confirmations now of the yin confirmations the least yin of the yin confirmations and therefore the most yang is jui yin so that's the most yang of the yin confirmations and that's also said to be rich in blood with little chi now, Jwayin represents the death of yin. So if we look at that on like a day-time cycle, Tai yin is the biggest yin, kind of at midnight, and then yin starts to decline, and that's Jwayin. Yin is declining as yang is growing, but it's still a yin confirmation because it's not, the sun hasn't yet popped over the horizon. You know, you haven't, you're not actually in enough, you, haven't, you don't have enough yang to be in a yang state. Your yin is just depleting. Now, as soon as, you move from that drain state as soon as the sun kind of pops over the horizon, as soon as yin depletes to the point where yang becomes predominant, it's now Xiao Yang, little yang, which then grows to big yang. So we can see there the most yang of the yin confirmations, which is also rich in blood, is Jui Yin. And that is the circulation of blood on the interior. Mm -hmm. And Tai Yang is a circulation of blood on the exterior. But they're both rich in blood with little chi. They're mo both um, the most yang of the yang and the yin. And the key herb to treat both of those is still Guajia. It just then depends how you combine it. Because you actually see a formula, Dangwe Sinitang, which is a formula to basically treat cold of the blood, cold vasoconstriction, where you get freezing cold extremities, um, you know, a very deep thing, what we call an expiring pulse, a pulse which just can't maintain expansion against your fingers. It just, you're taking it, you don't decrease the pressure and the pulse just disappears. Now, Dangwe Sinitang is based on the formula Guajia Tang, and Guajia Tang is one of the core formulas to actually revive the function of Tai Yang. That is actually what in the Tang Yijing was called Xiao Yin Dan, Xiao Yang Dan Tang, the minor dawn warming decoction, when the dawn isn't warming up enough, when not enough yang is getting out into the environment. 
the thing is though, um, in Greyjah Tang, you have Greyjah to revive the Yang of the blood, basically, to warm the blood of Tai Yang. But then you also have Sheng Jiang, fresh ginger. Um, because in a Greyjah Tang, you're sweating. You're losing Yang outwards because sweating is the body cooling down. Um, because of that as well, your surface is drying out. So you have no fluids in your surface to actually hold your Yang. So your Yang's floating out. And your surface is drying out and contracting. So you need to get fluids from the center out to the surface to revive the fluids of the surface. And you use the formula Sheng Jiang, fresh ginger, to do that. So remember, you used dry ginger to actually warm the center. Mm-hmm. Fresh ginger is the same. It's still pungent um, earth herb of the wood class. So it tonifies wood's control of earth. Remember, wood creates an upwards outwards movement. So fresh ginger is much more dispersing. It basically, it's fresher. There's more chemically, there's more volatile oils in it. From a Chinese perspective, you know, it's younger, therefore more active. It more represents the outwards movement of wood. So fresh ginger disperses fluids from the center out to the surface. So that's what kind of promotes a sweat in Greg's tank. It's what gets fluids to the surface. Mm. Now in Dangwe Sini Tang, Dangwe Sini Tang is a variation of Greg's tank where you actually take out the Sheng Jiang. You don't, you do a few other things, but the difference there is you can understand that because the, the aspect which warms the blood is still the same. You've still got the same Guaja in there, but in Guaja Tang, Sheng Jiang disperses from the earth. So it's lifting above the earth. So it's almost like if you imagine the horizon, it's like it's lifting the sun above the earth. So it's mm. sending it to the periphery. If you take the Sheng Jiang out, you're still warming the blood exactly the same, same dose of Guaja, but you're not lifting things above the earth. You're keeping the action that form, you're deeply rooted inside. So you're treating the blood circulation on the interior rather than the blood circulation on the exterior. So there you're treating the liver or Jueyin blood rather than treating the exterior or Tai Yang. So that's kind of where the liver comes into that. And that's, again, an example of classical formula structure. It's so much in just these little tweaks. I mean, there's a little bit more. There's a few other herbs in Dangwe Sinitang which have differing functions. But that's a really, really key thing that you take the Sheng Cheng out. Because it says also in um, line... Line 87 or line 83 of the Shanghai. It's been a while since I've revised it, but it says basically in a blood collapse patient, you don't promote sweating because they'll be cold, shuddering, and twitching. Basically, you, a blood collapse patient, somebody with no blood is already cold. So you sweat them even more, you're going to cool their blood down even more. They're going to get more cold, shuddering, and so on. So that tells us that tells us why we take the Sheng Jiang out. We don't want to lift the formula up out to the exterior. We want to keep that yang deep on the interior. So we take Sheng Jiang out, we take out the herb, which lifts the action of the formula surface it's interesting it's it, it's almost i i, mean, I suppose the use of uh, shang jang in 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 greater time is almost the opposite of shock right like from actually from cold i suppose your body mm. kind of closes in and sends the blood to your to your core yeah trying to keep you uh you know alive yeah you're trying, to, you're trying to suggest to it to just reverse that process a little bit yeah, but I can see that. Uh, 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 yes, I can see that look in Yasin's eye. He wants to ask you a question. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. You're you're muted. Ah, yeah. Okay, I was um, just saying. I can I can um, think of plenty of new questions that keep popping up as we discuss. But um, I think we've reached um, a uh, uh, a good point to maybe we to explicitly address so to take it down now to the level of 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 ex, you know um examples of specific formulas perhaps a typical um tcm formula or a contemporary formula as opposed to a, a um a classical formula um and to maybe look at to try and compare them uh and to address why one is 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 better designed uh, than the other, um, and yeah, we'll see where that takes us. Um, but uh, I know for certain, just putting that out there, that I shall have to listen to this uh, several more times. But um, but yeah, if we could if we could start if we could take it down to to an ex- to the level of explicit, um, uh, uh, you know, to to actual formulas, that might actually help me. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, there's a few examples I can think of. I mean, again, I say like, uh, there's as as somebody who kind of really looks for really focused kind of 
what are called like the beauty of classical formulas <laughs> there are some modern forms i just don't like the look of but i will say you know if your system has a way of using these forms there's no such thing as a bad formula so i don't want to offend anyone but there are some things which from a classical perspective i think are very good examples um yeah. one which always comes to me i'd just like to add an editorial note there because i think that is absolutely the case it's not so much oh we don't like this formula it's more like here's what this system has to offer i think is what we're looking for yeah yeah um and you know there's yeah if if you have a way of using things then it's yeah it's good hmm. yeah i mean one example i always give is the the formula sujinza tang i always feel this is a very good example because that's a more modern formula when I say more modern, it's about a thousand years old. It's still, you know, it's not a classical form because it's not of the classics, which were about two thousand years ago. But it's it's a very very good example because it's a popular little unit that's used nowadays. It's a very popular formula, but I think classically it has a lot of design flaws. Um, and I can tell I'm probably going to piss a lot of people off talking about this formula this way, but I think this formula is so confused and does, yeah, that there's. So many areas it could be made better by being made into a classical form. And it's, but it's got a structure which is very close to a number of classical forms. But there's key bits where I would say they're missing. And others may disagree on that. And that's kind of fine. But um, so Sujinza Tang um, is a formula which is basically, you know, designed to treat, you know, what would be considered just kind of spleen deficiency, you know, pale complexion, weak pulse, fatigue, with some digestive weakness like loose stool and that kind of thing. Um, like I said, it's a very popular formula nowadays. It's made up of renshin, ginseng, um, baiju, um, fuling, and jirgansa, so four herbs. I think this is a very, very good example because there's a number of four herb formulas in the Shanghenlun Jingwe, which also are very similar, but there's really key differences. Now, the there's certain things about it which are good in that um yeah I'll, I'll come to that in a minute but basically let's compare it to a classical formula to treat weakness of the center which would be the formula Li jong wan which would treat cold of the center this this basically treats a cold damp center you know a tie-in issue um where the primary symptoms would be diarrhea nausea lack of appetite abdominal fullness um now that formula is very very similar it has renchen it has baiju it has jirgansa so three of the herbs are the same but there's one key difference it has ganjang where so ginger tang has fooling now this points to something we talked about earlier which is that classically we understand Function always fails before matter. And you, you basically cannot have a disease without a yang deficiency. All disease starts with a failure of function, with a failure of yang. Um, and that's a basic division of yin and yang, the division of form and function. And whenever something is happening in the body, function always fails first. So in a Sujinza tang, there's a reason you have that spleen deficiency. You know, that spleen tube deficiency is a failure of function of the spleen. It is a cooling off of the center. It just is. But the problem is in Sujinza Tang, there's nothing to actually revive the yang of the center. Now, people have said to me for, oh, Ren Shen's war. It's like, well, like if you use Hong Ren Shen, yeah, like it's it's a bit warm, but it's not really reviving yang of the center. It's it's not, basically, it's not enough. And the second thing is, again, if you understand the center is cold and damp, you wood is not controlling the center. So you need a pungent herb to revive wood's control of earth, to lift that damp soft center, to help the earth move, and to tonify fire to warm the earth. So you don't have that in Sujin's tank. That's why you have the ganchang in Li Jongwen, because that fulfills the basic failure of function. Now the Renshen, that's a nice herb to have in there because Renshen in the Tang Jing is the earth herb of the earth class. Sweet flavors tonify the earth, because in this sense, the earth is just earth nutritive, nourishing fluids within the body. And Renshen is just, a replacement for that basically you've lost nutritive to whatever means through diarrhea through vomiting through sweating you replace it with renchen it's, it's almost like herbally it's a like for like replacement so both those both formulas have renchen and that's very good but the thing is when you renchen isn't the key herb to treat a an issue of the center ganchang is because the issue of the center does not start with the loss of fluids 
function has to have failed before you lose the fluids. Otherwise, why else is the body losing fluids? Mm -hmm. um, so the first herb is ganjang, and it's actually the form of ganjang, uh, gansao ganjang things, like the basic structure, jiu gansao and ganjang, um, because the ginger, you know, as we've said, you know, tonifies wood to fan fire to warm earth, and it also tonifies wood to control earth to help lifting the center. Because everybody talks about the spleen lifting the clear of the center. The spleen doesn't actually lift the clear of the center. It's wood's control of earth, which ensures the lifting of the clear of the center. If you took away the control of wood, which is basically the presence of the pungent flavor, the upwards outwards movement of wind, the center would not lift. And okay. if you took away the warming of fire, the center would not lift. The spleen does not do anything in and of itself. It's the control of wood and the warming of fire which does that. So you need to revive wood to do that. You need to basically revive the presence of a pungent flavor. Um, and then the Jirgan cell is a little bit of sweet moderation. So you always have these checks and balances. So ginger, jang, is the earth herb of the wood class. So it tonifies wood to influence her. And Jirgan cell is the opposite. It's the wood herb of the earth class. It's sweet and sweet flavors moderate, but it's specifically sweet moderation to control the balance between wood and earth. So it's almost like the ginger puts the control of wood on earth, the gigantile, the licorice moderates that. It stops it from being too much, basically. It's a moderating influence. So that's why gigantile, ganjang pang is the core structure to strengthen the yang of the center, the yang of the earth. And then the renshen on top of that replenishes the fluids that have been lost because the function of the center has failed. Um, and then we have the baiju in both forms, which is, again, it's it's the next step. It's basically lifting any of that turbid dampness off of the earth that is is there because of the failure of function. So the, the earth has cooled off, fluids have accumulated. You're treating that that real pathology with the gancheng or the gancheng ganso. But you have some pathological byproduct, which is basically the cold damp. So you have baiju on there to basically help lift that off and descend the turbid dampness out through the intestines, get it out that way, help form the stool. Um, so that's there to treat that, that kind of pathological byproduct. So all of that is good. Now, so ginger tang is missing that revival of yang. And the other thing is it has the herb fooling in it. Now, fooling is nowadays considered a dampness herb. It's not, it's a water herb. And this is kind of one issue that again, nowadays dampness and water are kind of lumped in together. People really don't differentiate between the two, but it's important to, because water is a thin fluid, a clear fluid. Dampness or room is a turbid fluid, and they're two different things, and they're treated differently. Mm. So to treat water, you can use a sweet herb-like feeling, and you get it out through the bladder. To treat dampness, you actually need bitter flavors to remove dampness. Basically, grab them, pull them out through the intestine. That's the difference between fooling by you. Fooling treats dampness or room. Um, sorry. Baiju treats dampness or room, fooling treats water. Now, okay, you I say you get water out through the bladder, dampness out through the intestines. Now, separate thing, if you have dampness actually in the urinary tract, yes, you get that out through the bladder because it's at the exit. But if it's any higher than the urinary tract, like on the digestion, you don't actually pee out dampness. You you remove water, which is the thin part. Dampness, you get it out through the stool. And baiju is a representative herb to do that with cold dampness. Now, in Sajinza Tang, you have fooling. Now, the problem there is that is not addressing the center dampness. Now, that will be leaching out thin fluids, but all that does is if you have the turbid dampness on the center, yes, that's a mixture of thin and thick fluids, but if you just leach out the thin fluids, you're left with much more turbid dampness. You know, you've basically made that dampness thicker and stickier. So the fooling is not contributing anything, and it's potentially actually slowing things down. So that's why in Li Zhongwan, you don't see fooling because it's a center dampness issue. It's not a water issue. And you do see ganjang because the very reason that pathology occurs is because the center is cooled down. Now, so ginger tang gets those two things, I would say, kind of a bit wrong in that it does have feeling. So it's dealing with thin fluids when you're actually saying this is meant to be a spleen sheet deficiency with some dampness of the earth. And second thing, it doesn't have ganjang. It doesn't have any revival of the yang center. So you're not really kind of reviving the function that's failed. And again, you're putting the wrench in. How are you going to metabolize that wrench in? Your spleen is already weak. Your earth is already weak. So how does that, you know, you're, you're using the body's own yang. Now, there is a modification of sujit and tang, which we will get into in a minute. But there's just two other classical forms which I want to 
talk about, which have a very similar structure, but have slight variations. And this is the formulas Lingwei Jugantang and the formula Shenzhou Tang, also known as, known as Ganjiang Lingju Tang. Before you get there, Laurie, yeah. I, I want to, I just, because I like to take these moments and summarize uh, so we can wrap our head around these things. But it's interesting, you know, as you were talking, it, it seems to me that there are these very specific things that you're talking about with these formulas. You're not mm. even actually saying this formula <clears throat> is less effective. You're saying almost there are, there are these, there are very specific things about the design of this formula which mean that if you used it in a particular context with a certain understanding, it would be perfect. But mm -hmm. it actually gets used a little bit wrong because some things are going on. And what I have here is yes. you've got this um, precision in terms of the nature of the herb. You've got precision in terms of the physiology. So that discussion about dampness, it's not just dampness, it's dampness of a per particular kind in a particular place. Mm -hmm. You need to understand the herbs in a way that allows you to deal with that, the pathway of releasing it. You've got the relation in that formula between, um, you know, you're talking about ganjang and then you're talking about how, you know, you don't, you don't have a way of uh, tonifying the fire to help deal with the dampness. So you've got the relation to other aspects of physiology mm. you need to think about. And then you've got this particular emphasis on restoring function which seems to be a theme that we're, that we're you know, there, there's less emphasis on function. And this seems to me to be, according to how you view things, a fundamental um, a barrier to effectiveness. Mm. Um, I mean, in the system that you're using. Um, and it's interesting because I, I think I read somewhere that people were a little bit afraid of ganja. You know, that the fooling was seen as somehow less um, intense, right? Mm. And to be saying it may be intense but used correctly you're fine mm. yeah and that is yeah, yeah I, mean, I think you've, you've just given an excellent summary of a number of points there and what you say about ganjang there yes yeah, is, is spot is what we talked about earlier that people became more and more scared of hot pungent herbs and this is a good example you see hot pungent herbs being phased out for other herbs but change you know taking ganjang out you're then saying, well, why has this problem occurred in the first place? How has this person sent her got weak and damp and so on without a ganjang pathology occurring? Which, when classically, when you say ganjang, you mean the center is cooled down. That's what you mean by saying that. Your, your formula, your treatment is your diagnosis. So giving ganjang means the center is cold. Otherwise, you're not giving ganjang. You know, that's that's how you can say this is a gauge tank pattern, this is a ganjang pattern, so on. So, yeah, but then taking out ganjang, adding like then having fooling, it, that's a completely different... You go from reviving your own centre to leaching thin fluids out the bladder. They're two completely different things. You see, it shifts it completely. Right. And if you want to leach the thin fluids out the bladder, then that's a fantastic formula. No. <laughs> because then... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, because... Um, this formula is meant to be treating the problem of the centre. Now, you could say it's earth not controlling water so okay. thin fluids are built up in the lower jam but then this form would then be completely wrong because then you shouldn't be using ren shen okay your baiji dose should be different you should be using a lower dose of baiji for that relative to the feeling and so on and that's where you get into these other variations because then if earth is not controlling water therefore water is building up in the lower thin fluids building up in the lower that means the lower has cooled off for some reason otherwise you wouldn't have an excess of yin or an excess of fluids building up then as soon as you have an excess of yin, you by definition have a deficiency of yang. And if you're going to leach fluids out with fooling, you need to revive the yang bladder to help push these fluids out, otherwise you're still cooling the body off. And if you urinate, you'll notice your urine is warm, it's kind of around body temperature. So that warmth going out through the urine is still yang that's being lost, so you have to put that back in somehow. So then you need a guajia fooling combination. This brings us to another variation, which is lingue jugantang, mm -hmm. um, which is guajia fooling baiju Jugantang. So you have the baiju to dry the center, but it's in a it's in a lower dose. So for digestive issues, you'll notice Zhang Zhongjing uses his baiju at three liang. I'm going to use liang rather than grams because there's you know different schools on what a, a you know what a liang converts to grams. But as long as your ratios are consistent, this is fine. But you notice that if it's a center problem, a digestive issue, it's generally 
Baiju at three Liang. If it's Earth not controlling water, it's generally Baiju at two Liang. Sometimes three Liang the digestion starts to creep in, but generally it's, it's two Liang because you don't want that strong bitter drying center. You you actually need you actually want slightly less bitter. You still want the bitter consolidation of water in the lower, and you want to ensure the earth doesn't get too damp so it can control water, but you don't need the strong drying consolidating of the stool, which you would use for baijiu on the center. So you see the, the dosage of baiju or the ratio of baiju in the formula changing. So you have baiju to address that earth water balance. You have feeling, and feeling goes up in dose because you start to have palpitations, because again, if water is building up in the lower, that pressurized descending aorta causes rebellion against the upper. And again, if the bladder has cooled off, that means the small intestine is cooled off, which means the heart is cooled off. Um, so you have baiju feeling, but you have guaijia to revive yang, not ganjang, because this is not a problem with the center now. This is a problem with cooling off the bladder, so you need to warm the small intestine to warm the bladder. So that then brings in lingue ju gantang, which is again a, a variation around a similar structure. Then you have another formula, shenzo tang or ganjang lingju tang. So li jonglen that we talked about before was cold dampness of the center, a cold turbid fluid on the center. Lingue ju gantang is a room formula. Um, so it's cooling off, you know, it's still ruining the center, but you get this, this issue of the bladder. You're trying to leach fluids out through the bladder instead. Now, shenzhou tang is old dampness collapsing into the lower. So it's the same dampness that was present in Li Zhongwan, but it's no longer in the center. It's collapsed into lower, and you get these symptoms of heavy, achy body, you know, dragging down, feeling around the waist, a feeling of cold in the lower. But it says urination and appetite are fine. So the digestion in the bladder is not the issue, but the dampness of the center is collapsing to the lower. So in that formula, you still have ganjang, because the problem's coming from cold at the center, but it's collapsed into the lower. So it's not a problem of greater. It's not the cooling off of the lower, it's the cooling off of the center. Hmm. But you then also have baiji, but that goes down in dose to the tu liang, which is earth controlling water. And then you actually have fooling, because now the fluids have collapsed the turbid fluids of the center collapse into lower and they're mixing with those thin fluids of the lower. Mm. Um, and then the Gantau as well. So the reason why I always talk about these three formulas in relation to Sajunza Tang is because Sajunza Tang is kind of trying to do a bit of all of those forms, but is is none of them. It's mm. not clear on which of those pathologies it is. It's kind of saying it's a Li Zhongwen pathology, but it has elements of Lingue Jigan Tang and Shenzo Tang, but it is none of them. And the one thing it's missing out of which all of those forms have is some pungent warm revival of Yang. And that's that's a really key thing there. And it's also that confusion about fooling in the Sajinza tank. And just an interest, just one point, one thing I always find funny about this, as you mentioned Ganjang, as you mentioned about people being worried about Ganjang being too hot. And this is still something you hear now. Hmm. One, it's it's just always a, an amusing thing I always um think about when it comes to well, two things when it comes to modern Chinese medical practice, especially with herbs. I, I don't know if you'll have experienced this, but if the if you've been to a few practitioners they've talked to you about diet what are two things a lot of chinese medicine practitioners will tell you you should never eat or you should cut down on uh dairy i suppose and cold foods yeah dairy and cold foods or dairy and salads especially okay. now everyone always says that everyone's yin deficient and everyone's got like a cold damp center but you will notice like here there's this fear of ganjang now, if you should not eat cold foods, surely you should eat ganjang. Right. And they'll also, they'll also tell you to put loads of ginger in your food. But when yeah. it comes to prescribing herbs, they won't do things that warm the center. Second, yeah. they'll tell you you're really yin deficient, and they'll, you know, they'll give you like endless thick, sticky herbs, but they'll tell you to cut dairy out of your diet because it's too warms too much damp. It's a really interesting thing. The lifestyle advice they give is much closer to what would be understood in classical pathologies in don't eat cold foods because your center is cooling off. When it comes to prescribing herbs, they won't follow that logic. Well, honestly, it's not just, uh, I mean, Yasin and I are from the uh, Middle East um, mm. and um, <clears throat> anybody, you know, any 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 system of medicine, any traditional system of uh, understanding diet or whatever is always, always, always talking about warming the digestion in that way. And I, yeah, yeah. So it's, <laughs> that's kind of, I actually never put those two things together. That's really funny. Yeah, it just occurred to me one day as well that there's this fear of like warm, pungent herbs and this constant tonification of yin in all the forms and so on. But then in diet, they're telling people to do completely the opposite. Um, but yeah, there was one thing when we looked at Sajun's tanks, I know that people then come back with this. There are modifications of Sajun's tank. Um, there's a lot of them actually. 
Yeah. So there's, I think there's like Wuwei Igong San, which is Sujin's Tang Kha's Chimpi. Chimpi, you know, like the tangerine, not, yeah, tangerine peel, which is then, it's a bit more pungent, kind of thick dampness resolving on the center or cutting through the dampness. And then there's Liu Jin's Tang, um, which is, hang on, um, Sheng, what is it again? Sheng Fu plus Chen Pi, I think. Hang I, I would have to check this in a while since I've uh, revised my classical, uh, my my modern formulas. Um, but basically, this this is when they say, oh, there's people with more dampness on the center, so we need more kind of pungent moving herbs to cut through that. Well, then at that point, why not just use a Li Zhong Wan? And then there's the next step, Sheng Sha Liu Jin Zetang, which is when you're adding Mu Sheng and Sha Ren, which is, again, more pungent revival when you get much more bloating and fawn stuff. At that point, again, why are you not just using a legion one? Mm. You've taken that aspect out of the um, out of the structure to make the sejinza tank, and then you've put it back in. Well, yeah, you've kind of put it back in, but not really. You've you put you've done you've added four herbs that could have yeah. done what one could have done. Or if you're getting to that point where it's a lot of bloating forms and so on, you move away from that structure entirely. You go to like a form which is hobu sheng zheng ben sha ren sheng gan sha tang, which is a five herb formula literally for abdominal fullness due to cold dampness where you have and i've got there's a funny case about this as well where you have you know you have hopal which basically treats abdominal fullness and again depending on what you combine that with whether it's hot or cold or so on hopal plus darwin hot abdominal fullness hopal plus ginger cold abdominal fullness and this is hopal plus ginger this time sheng jang because you want to disperse more dampness mm -hmm. but it's still that revival of the yang in the center plus bansha with a small amount of Ren Shen and Gansau. Now the Hopu and Shengjiang are at relatively high dose in that formula. Well, we would convert it to 24. It would be, I think, 8 Liang um, in that formula. That's for whole dampness causing bloating and so on. So it's kind of, if you're using Shangshai Liu Jin's tank for a lot of cold dampness causing bloating and fullness on the center, that's a much more concise form to use. Now, there are Shang Hanlin case study books out there and um, there's a really funny case which just kind of shows, kind of shows even when people are trying to use classical forms now, they'll alter the dosages and they'll try and moderate things a lot. Because a lot of people, a lot of the reasons now for prescribing big formulas with loads and loads of herbs is twofold. A, people think that if you give just a few herbs, it won't do very much. But also they're kind of scared of the focus of that, and especially a few herbs in relatively high pronounced dose. Like a lot of forms have very uniform dosaging where nothing's really emphasized because again, there's a lot of fear around actually doing something in case you get it wrong. Mm. So there's this case, um, which I saw once of somebody coming in with a whole bush, Xinjiang, Bancho, Renjiang, Gans, Tang, Pap, a lot of fullness and bloating. So that physicians prescribe whole bush, Xinjiang, Bancho, Renjiang, Gans, Tang, which is very nice, but they altered the dosages. They put the doses of whole bush, Xinjiang, and Bancho all down. But then they added a load of dampness moving and dampness transforming herbs to it to have greater effect on bloating. And I just looked at this and I thought, you've done two modifications. You've lowered the dosage of the herbs, which will remove the dampness and the bloating and fullness. But then you've added in a load of other herbs to do it. Mm. Why? Why not just use the formula in, in its original basis? Then you don't need to modify. Part of the reason is because, I suspect, because there's either, there's either a feeling it won't do it or there's a feeling it will do too much. And this is the thing. It's like... If you give one herb to perform a function, that's going to be much more blunt and focused than giving five herbs at lower dose to perform that function. You know, mm -hmm. that spreads the action out a bit more. And in many ways, that's kind of a safer way of doing it. But the thing is, this, this is what I said earlier. Classical forms are often much smaller and much more concise because they're more focused, which means when you get them right, the effect is amazing. It's really brilliant because they are so focused. But the thing is, you have to be better at getting them right, basically. Now, if you're prescribing big formulas, they're much, much more moderate, so they're much, much safer. Their effect will not be as good. But you have much, much more margin for error. And that's kind of part of the reason for formulas being so big now. And I don't think that's a good thing. We're basically saying we're not prepared to get good enough to use a focused approach. Sure. Um, and this is the thing. Like, you see this a lot This with these kind of formulas. Like, if you're going to use um, Liu Jin's tank or Shang Sha Liu Jin's tank for digestive weakness, actually just use Li Zhong Man. That will be enough. Revive the Yang of the Center with Ganjang, a nice focused for her formula. You know exactly what's going on. Or if it's bloating and so on, it's the main issue. Use Hopu Sheng Zheng Ban Chen and Ganzha Tang. But you don't need to go into much, much bigger formulas. Because the other thing is, the more herbs you put in a formula, 
the less of a clear message that formula sends to the body. And again, when we're putting a, a formula into the body, we're giving the body a message. We're asking it to do a certain thing. The much clearer your message and much more focused, the more able the body will be to do that thing. And this is the thing classically in, you know, the seven classes of formulas in the Naging. There's one class which is a big formula and a small formula. And a big formula is two herbs, like up to two herbs. A small formula is like nine herbs or more. Um, and that's always really confusing. But the way we interpret that is it's a big or a small message. So if you give a two herb formula, that's a very, very big message. If you give a nine herb formula, the message is much smaller because it's much less focused. And the thing is, you want to give the biggest possible message, the clearest, most concise message. It's like if you're... Man oh, yeah, you go. Sorry, I, I was just... I'd like to tack on to something that I feel... Um could take us in an interesting direction because mm. we've been talking about formula modifications. Um, we've been talking about the uh, relation of herb to what function in the body it, it corresponds to and what we're trying to do. Now, what just for the sake of argument, what if a certain patient um, can't, um, or, or is, is, let's say, allergic to a particular herb or doesn't seem to be uh, this is the formula that you know you th that want that a practitioner feels that patient ought to be given but apparently one of those herbs is producing a um a, 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 a undesired effect let's say that that herb is guaja for instance what would you then um do if you weren't if you if you had one hand you know that your hand tied behind your back and you could no longer use guaja um what would then be is that pot is, is that something that you have, have been presented with and um is there what way around that uh could you see yeah there's a number of aspects that the first thing is like when you prescribe a formula it's different to prescribing the, the herbs as individuals so sometimes you will see people where they they can't tolerate a herb by itself but in the context of a formula they can because part of the point of formula science is to moderate certain side effects of certain herbs. So like in, in the formula, Simi Tang, for example, Futsa, Ganjang, Gansau, part of the point of using those three herbs together is that the Gansau moderates the Futsa and the Ganjang, makes them you know takeable. So that's one aspect of it, that a herb behaves differently by itself than in a whole formula. The next thing I'd say is that... Um, the if if you say somebody is reacting badly to Guaja, my answer then would be they're not a Guaja patient. Guaja is not the right treatment, so then we should not persist with that. That's an indication that that's not the right conclusion that we've reached, and that's a very good in indication. That's another reason for prescribe, prescribing clear, concise formulas, because if your formula is your diagnosis, and by that I mean if you're prescribing a Guaja-based formula, you're saying the root of this problem is cold and small. <laughs> Let's say you give Guaja and it produces an adverse effect. It produces much, much more heat and restlessness and dark urine and so on. The very reasonable conclusion to reach from that was that I was wrong in my initial hypothesis that this was a Guaja problem, and this actually wasn't. If, if Guaja produces symptoms, then I'd say, well, that's actually then heat in the small intestine. This would then be like maybe like a Judza problem, which would be the opposite. Um, so that would be my kind of conclusion from that. Now, very 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 occasionally and i find this incredibly rare as in like once i i think once i've seen this in my whole time like allergies to single herbs within the right formula because generally i do find if it's the right formula it's kind of fine like we use the herb sheer by a lot but then you have people coming in saying you know they react badly to like any food of like the onion species but using sheer by within a formula and they're fine on it um, so this thing of in allergies to individual herbs, it's it's valid and it's something you should not be flippant about. But I've found that it's incredibly rare that plays out in the right formula. And if it does, you know, there's always going to be one or two isolated, it's, you know, occurrences or one or two isolated cases where you may have to do something but that's that's definitely not the vast majority that's definitely not the 99.9 percent .9 of it and if would, you know if that is the case sometimes maybe you have to be flexible but I've, I've honestly found like if we say like a ginger allergy because people talk about this a lot but i've honestly like 
in 15 years of me doing this and actually trying to be quite um observant of reactions i haven't really found it to be the case i think one patient in all that time has had a kind of serious issue with that um and then in that case i actually persisted a bit longer with opening the stomach a bit more and opening the sanjiao and after that they could then actually take ginger so the conclusion i would have to draw from that was they were having a reaction ginger because at the time that wasn't the appropriate method but then with treatment that issue resolved which then meant they could take it um but yeah i mean if you do have a patient who just does have a reaction to ginger no matter what then in that that one isolated case you would yeah have to be a bit a bit more flexible and then you may have to work with a roundabout way of doing it but those those things are actually really incredibly rare um there's there's always going to be something there's always going to be like that one patient who is a bit difficult but then that yeah that doesn't really kind of invalidate the system for like the 99.9 percent like I, I really do know that is very very rare for that to happen um one of the rules then that i'm picking up you know i think this relates to our our last question for you for today is one of the rules that i'm picking up is about how uh you know because we've talked about the individual herbs hmm. we've talked about the uh the formulas which was an for me a, just an absolutely fascinating discussion and and i think it would be good to close off with with um with the use of the formulas so not the herbs themselves not the formulas themselves but 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 the the i don't know what the word is people have such a negative reaction to like uh to to rules or constraints but i think those are the things that make things workable right so yeah. <laughs> you know and i remember um the first classical practitioner that i went to i uh, said oh yeah he said something and then he said that's why you you know jang jong jing uh, doesn't use uh, chai hu and dangwei together and i have of course i was fascinated by what he was saying and i have also forgotten it and so i'm glad that i'm speaking to you now one of those rules seems to be what i'm picking up from you is focus so mm -hmm. <clears throat> these formulas need to be used they're very focused in their design and so you need to understand how you're using them because it's like you're using a scalpel you're not using a big sort of like sledgehammer what are some of these rules that you have found to be helpful for number one just generally being effective with your patients but also for improving as a practitioner mm. that yeah fun. Yeah, I think that's an excellent thing to talk about because, yeah, like you say, people don't like the idea of rules, especially, I think, the kind of people who go into Chinese medicine generally don't. <laughs> There's a very kind of big kind of anti-structure, especially anti thing. But the, the thing is, that, you know, the rules, I, I I kind of agree with you that in many ways that, that word can create a negative reaction. We kind of use it because these rules are really just um, adhering to physiology adhering to the laws of yin and yang and when we talk about these rules these are just kind of ways we sort of crystallized the the idea of this is what can actually go wrong in the body so this is what you can do to treat it so for example we, there's certain herbs we wouldn't combine like you wouldn't really combine guaja or like say futsa and judza together because one treats hold of the small intestine fluid layer the other treats heat of the small intestine fluid layer so combining those two together you're contradicting yourself and this is kind of one thing I always say to people, especially when they're modifying, is when you are prescribing a formula, you're making a statement about what you think is causing the disease in that person and what you think the pathology is. When you modify, you don't want to do anything that contradicts that statement. Mm. And this comes back to the idea of, yeah, your formulas, you do want them to be precision formulas. Because just because you throw a load of herbs into a formula doesn't mean they're going to do what you say they're going to do or what you want them to do you have to understand that it's an interaction it's a conversation with the body so you're putting herbs in and you're asking the body to do something the body can only do what it needs to do at that time and what you give it a message to so classical formulas again when i say they're like that i could adhere to the rules of physiology they're replacing certain bits of physiology if you put the wrong bit of physiology it will create an adverse symptom again you're never going to get it completely right so if you are clear and focused even when you get it wrong then you can get clear feedback but then, yeah, this idea of rules, it's, it's just adhering to those laws of physiology. So, for example, 
Like something as Chaihu and Dangwe. Um, yeah, it's something we really don't do much classically. It's done all the time nowadays. It does, you know, generally it's not a bad thing as such. It's not going to produce adverse results. There's lots of popular formulas nowadays that use the two together. But classically, it's not really done. It's only really done in the formula Shu Yuan, which is the second biggest classical formula, which is basically a, a general tonic for people who easily get ill. Like it's, it's a very, very big formula with a lot going on. But other than that, Zhang Zhongjin never does it anywhere else. And almost the fact he does it in one massive form that doesn't do it anywhere else is um, almost kind of like a sign he's intentionally avoiding it. And the reason for this is, um, the first thing I will say is that I don't ever see the need to combine the two. And we've got to look at what we're treating when we're using Dengue and Chai Hu. Um, so Chai Hu treats, Chai Hu opens the Sanjiao. It's a bitter herb, thin bitter flavor. So it's of neutral chi and thin bitter flavor. So its flavor is the predominant guiding action, but it's not an overwhelming thing. You know, it's not a heavy, heavy descent, but it does descend, but it kind of descends and floats. So it's neutral chi means it kind of floats outwards, but it descends, which is the movement of ministerial fire through the Sanjiao. It's a kind of down and out movement. So we see in line... 230 or is it 231 of the shank? And then it says, you know, Chai Hu Tangs or Chai Hu opens the upper so fluids can descend. So it kind of opens the upper jaw so all of the fluids in the body can descend through it. So it basically treats an excess condition of stagnation in the Sanjiao. Mm -hmm. Now, Dengue treats the blood layer, which is a deficient condition. It treats Zhui Yin, whereas Chai Hu treats Xiao Yang. Now, if you have excess in the Sanjiao, you can't yet get to the blood layer. Yes, you can put Dengue in a formula and say, write down, I'm going to tonify blood and move the Sanja. But that doesn't mean the body's going to do that. You know, you've got, you've got um, roads blocked on the way to the shop where you're going to buy your supplies to build your blood. You can keep saying, I'm going to buy stuff at the shop, but if you can't get through the blockage in the road, you can't yet buy stuff at the shop. You know what I mean? Mm. You can't start to work on the blood layer. Mm. Or you've unblocked the Sanja. So the two things, you, you just can't access the layer of Dangwe while you're still in a Chai Hu presentation. Now, if you're at a Dangwe presentation, you don't need Chai Hu. So if you're at the point where Dangwe is indicated, you don't actually then need Chai Hu. But second, let's look at actually, let's look at what Chai Hu Dangwe will do together. Like what does Dangwe do? Well, classically, Dangwe is a sweet herb, according to the, the Shang Ben Sai Jing. You know, it's sweet, mildly warm. It's basically sweet moderation of woodwind. And the, the way I always described it is it's like Gansau for the blood. Gansau or Chikansau is sweet moderation of woodwind. Dengue is the same, but it works on a blood layer. So it stops the spasming of all the small, you know, it stops the spasming of all the small space. So they all relax and open up so the blood can circulate better. And it also stops upwards, outwards movement, excessive woodwind when the blood is a bit dry. So it's just that sweet moderation. If you needed Chai Hu with sweet moderation of woodwind, you'd use Chai Hu Jogansa. That's That's what you do. That's why I've never seen a need for well many many years ago before i understood it's like my first few years of practicing so i was always like ah how do i do this you know but mm. so like I, I maybe did like my first year or two of practicing this but since then since i've really started to understand it i it just never even occurred to me to use the two together mm. um so chai hu jigan sao does exactly what chai hu dangwe would do but it's actually at the level jigan sao is actually at the level you can access where you're in a chai hu pattern now we we'll go further people nowadays often look at dangwe as a pungent warm herb um you know later uh, flavors change throughout time in dynasty so when we're looking at shanghan formulas we look at shanghan texts that reference flavors so we use a shang ben sajin because that's the predominant thought at that time so we don't analyze shanghan formulas with a later flavor model because that's not how zhang jung jing would talk about it just like when you're reading shakespeare you don't use a modern dictionary because the language is different mm -hmm. if you're looking at a ming dynasty formula look at what flavor that herb was considered in the Ming dynasty, because then you'll understand the designer's intention. But let's say nowadays, let's say you're coming at this from a, a modern perspective where Dengue, where you're seeing Dengue as pungent and warm. Now, again, if you're in Chai Hu, your San Zhao is stuck. Now, you're going to want to be careful with using pungent warm when your San Zhao is stuck. Because if your San Zhao is stuck, if circulation can't happen, if you run the block space, that can lead to further flaring of fire. Mm. Um, just like, you know, if you have a roadblock, you don't want to drive a fast car down it, you want to clear the car's gradually, so then you can drive down the road. It's the same thing. Now, I'm not saying you would never use warm pungent. You do see it in forms like Chai Hu Gui Chitang or so on. But, and actually to 
truly get out of a Xiaoyang pattern, because the Sanjo only gets stuck because Yang is weak. So to truly get out of it, you do actually need to warn blood and revive the Yang. And that's the difficult balance of treating Xiaoyang. But actually, if you're going to use a warm pungent herb to revive the Yang blood to warm the blood whilst in a Chai pattern, that's actually going to be greater. You're going to warm the blood via the small intestine, not via Chaiyan. So you're going to go about it more through that route rather than the Dangwei route. But you can't, again, you can't get to Dangwei at the point you're in Chai. And last, you could say, well, okay, Dangwei is blood nourishing. Um, what if the person's blood deficient and um, in Xiaoyang? Well, if you're in Xiaoyang at that point, again, you're not manifesting a state of blood deficiency. You will have that underlying. Yes, Xiaoyang does underlie Xiaoyang. But at the time you have a block San Zhao, you can't yet access a blood layer. So it's the same thing again. But let's say, okay, but I want to put in some sweet nourishment. Well, in Xiao Chai Tang, you already have Ren Shen Dat Sao Chigan Sao. All of those are already sweet, nourishing building of the blood. So at that point, you're not going to use Dangwei as a blood tonic. So it's more that, you know, it's, it's not going to be catastrophically wrong if you do Chai Dangwei. It's just never needed. And you can't access Dangwei while you're at Chai Hu. And if you're at, chai hu, if you're at Dangwei, you're no longer at Chai Hu. There's a lot of other examples like that, you know, like Zhang Zhong Jing doesn't use Tian Hua Fen and Ban Sha together. Now, again, nothing catastrophic is really going to happen if you're going to use that. But basically, Tianhua Fen treats a hot, dry stomach. Ban Sha treats a cold, damp stomach. Ban Sha treats nausea with absence of thirst. Tianhua Fen treats thirst with absence of nausea. So they're two contradictory patterns. That's why he never combines the two. Nothing bad is going to happen, but you want to be clear on which you're treating. You know, if you have a patient with nausea and absence of thirst, don't use Tianhua Fen. Use Ban Sha because Tianhua Fen is treating the opposite. So at, worst, at best, it will slow down your treatment. At worst, it can potentially cause adverse symptoms. You could say, well, then what if I have nausea and thirst? Well, then that actually tells you you're no longer at a middle jowl pathology. So it's neither Ban Sha or Tianhua Fen. Then it's a bladder pathology. Then it's like a wooling sound. So already, if you were to say, well, Tianhua Fen treats thirst, Ban Sha treats nausea, I'm going to throw them in together. Again, may, it may have some effect symptomatically, but through misunderstanding you're not actually getting to the actual mechanism of pathology and the fact there's nausea and thirst together tells you it's no longer a middle jowl issue and you can see again like ma huang chai hu you wouldn't use those two together they're both bitter flavors that descend the san jiao. um they both open the upper so fluids and um yes yeah, so basically fluids can descend because the descent of fluids and chi from the lungs is one and the same thing now they both work in a similar way of kind of floating but descending because they're both thin bitter flavors um but chai hu does it in a much more deficient pattern so ma huang used when the lungs are actually sealed shut on top so use a, a bitter warm flavor so that warmth actually pressurizes the upper a bit more to force the lungs open so things can descend in chai hu it's the lungs aren't actually closed it's just a bit stuck fluids are just suspended in the upper so using that bitter neutral so it's just mildly floating and descending so they both actually treat a kind of similar thing, but just one from a deficient perspective when it's just mild stuckness in the San Zhao. The other is when the, the Italian lungs are actually shut on top and they need more forceful opening. So if you give Mahong to a Chai Hu patient, they're going to have serious adverse results. They're going to have serious upward rushing, which you're creating too much pressurizing to force the lungs open. If you give Chai Hu to a Mahong patient, it's just not going to do enough. It's not going to resolve it. And there's going to be no situation where you're going to see those two together, where you're ever going to need Chai Hu and Ma Huang together. And you see line 37 of the Shanghai Lin, I think, or maybe 36, 37, I think, where it talks about, you know, somebody who has chest fullness, um, ribside tension. If the pulse is floating, use Ma Huang Tang. If it's floating and thin, you know, use Chai Hu Tang. You see that equivalency there. So they're both opening the long top to allow the San Jiao to descend. But again, you wouldn't use the two together because they're two different pathologies. So I think this is actually a good place to stop because it's it's it seems that what you're saying is you need to be able to understand what's happening in the patient's body. Mm. Rule number one. Yeah. And rule number two is um, everything sort of depends on that because, again, you're trying to return that proper physiology and the herbs are correspond with that proper physiology. And so you need those two things to come together. Mm which is a perfect place to stop, I think, because the the next installment is a conversation about diagnosis and how you would come yeah. to understand it. 
Yeah. And there's, yeah, there's actually one thing I would add to what you've said. So yeah, that's the case. But actually, the thing with classical formulas is, again, if you understand the treatment is a diagnosis and classical formulas mirror physiology, you don't need to think about all this in clinic. The classical formula contains all this detail. And you think about this detail outside of clinic. In clinic, you can just apply the formulas. And this comes around to what you're saying next of then the diagnostic methods we use, which get you straight to that without having to think about all this complex theory in clinic. So you go straight from what you're feeling uh, or what you're hearing from the patient or however it is that you're going to tell us that you diagnose mm. to understanding, oh, this is a chai hu pattern. This is a guajir pattern. This yeah. Is yeah, exactly. And that is where the Tien lineage comes in, because all of the theory we've talked about is not necessarily unique to the Tien lineage. I think like certain ways we, we understand it. You know, we understand, it, you know, we explain certain ways which other lineage may explain slightly differently. But all the theory I've talked about is outlined in the Neijing. It, it adheres to the rules of the Neijing. So there's nothing kind of unique there. But the thing that makes the Tien lineage unique is the pulse system, which allows you, you know, patient sits in front of you, you take the pulse, ask one or two confirmed questions, and that takes you to the formula. You prescribe the formula. Now, by looking at the formula, you can understand all the theory we've talked about. So then you can understand their pathology. But clinically, it's literally like the pulse tells you what formula you need and then as a treatment is diagnosis and formulas match physiology then you can work all this out so yeah that's uh, okay that's a great teaser for our next conversation yeah. which i am now i'm going to have a very difficult time waiting for okay Lori, it's really been uh i mean as yasin says i'm gonna have to go back and listen to this about 50 times and take notes and and uh and think about my life yasin <laughs> how's that looking for you yeah, I mean, I hope I don't have to brew too much about over my life, but um, I think I think listening to them will will definitely um, uh, help uh, uh, any life process I might be going through. It, it all sounds very um, intuitive. It sounds, it, it, yeah, um, and there's a lot of formulations that I'll have to go back and just sort of try and wrap my head around. We've just said right now, so you know putting bits of physiology back into the body that I'll, I'll need a I'll need a minute to sort of think about that but um yeah no thank you very much um for taking the time um to sit and discuss this uh with us um and going in for such detail and um and being so willing to answer some of these um follow-up questions um your, your answer to the question about grazier and replacing bits and formulas was a a revelation uh i must i must say so yeah um, yeah no thank you it's been and you know like i said before i've got to say like these are really good questions actually your follow-up questions and your kind of summaries are quite phenomenal considering you don't have any chinese medical background well, um think, it's been really good yeah yeah really I good chatting. the explanations were very clear and we're enjoying it that always helps yeah. wrap your head around something yeah. okay yeah. i think we'll see you then uh next week Yes. Uh, again, we can't thank you enough. I mean, you've been very generous with your time and we really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you for, for doing this as well. So. Thanks, Larry. All right.